Yeah, I'm from Spain. I live in London, but I'm I'm from Spain, from the north also, quite close, more or less, to to here. Where are you from? Finland. All right, hello everyone, and welcome to our last session before lunch. Please join me welcoming uh, on stage Ignacio and talking about how everyone, everyone can do data science in Python. Hi everyone, thanks for being here. Uh, my name is Ignacio Lola, and I'm going to talk a bit about how to do data science in Python and what data science is for me. So a quick overview, summary of what we are going to do. Uh, I'm going to talk who I am, what I do, so why I'm here actually talking about this. Uh, a bit of, of an overview of, about what data science means for me, what is the, let's say, flavor of data science that I'm going to be talking about. Um, and then we will do a quick overview of, of the data science uh, cycle in, with, with some examples in Python, data acquisition, cleaning, processing, and also using that data to, to predict some stuff. So that's me with a bit less of facial hair. Um, and who I am, I'm not a software developer by training. I studied physics, actually, so I'm more of a, from the, I came from the maths background or point of view. I've done some research in systems biology, complex systems, so always very interested in, in how things work between each other and things like that. Um, that drives my attention to big and small data not so so long time ago, and I started coding in Python around three years ago. Uh, you need to, to have in mind that my all my previous coding experience was doing Fortran 77 during university, and I'm not kidding, and it was not so long ago, probably they are still teaching Fortran 77 in physics, I'm sure. And yes, 77, not even Fortran 90. Um, I become obviously <laughs> in love with Python very easily, and I become also engaged in the startup world, uh, doing a lot of data science and, and those kind of things. I'm also a huge advocate of pragmatism and simplicity, uh, and you will see that in everything that I'm talking about today. That's why this talk is also pretty much a, a beginner's talk into data science, because I believe that uh, with very little tools, you can do a lot, actually. You cannot solve everything, that's for sure. There are still uh, problems and things that will need uh, very clever people to work on there for a lot of time, but most of the stuff actually can be solved quite quickly. Uh, by, by most of us. Uh, now, on contrary to, to saying that I'm a big advocate of pragmatism, I'm, I've done for the very first time all these slides in, in Python notebook because, well, I thought, you know, it's a Python conference. I should give it a go and do all my slide shows in Python. Uh, it makes sense. It took me forever, but I'm actually, so it was not very pragmatic, but I'm actually quite proud of the result, even if it doesn't look as good as if you know, I will try uh, to use PowerPoint or whatever. I'm also, one more thing, I'm also the, the, the man stand between you and the food from lunch, so I will try to be 
a bit fast and, and do this a bit fun. Because, yeah, I'm looking forward to food after all the introduction uh, early today about it. Uh, I also work at Import.io. This is relevant because of some of the stuff that I will be talking about and also because of the vision of the data that I have and the kind of data science that I do. Uh, and what is Import.io? Import.io is a platform that has two, two different things. It has on one hand a set of tools, free tools for people to use and get data from the web. So to do web scraping without having to code, it just has a UI. And, and you can interact with it with no really a lot of technical uh, knowledge and get data from the web, even doing crawlers or things like that. And it's also, on the other hand, an enterprise platform for, for just getting data. So we use our own tool and other things, and we just uh, generate very big data sets that, that we sell. Uh, I've been working in Proteo for a couple of years as a data scientist and more recently as the head of data operations, so, so heading basically the data services that put those data sets together and, and deliver those to, to customers. Uh, now, let's go into the, the, the topic. Uh, what, what we talk when we talk about data science? Uh, there, is a lot about, there is a lot of hype around data science, which obviously came with good things and bad things. Uh, when you have hype, there is some good things about it. There is a lot of jobs around it, so it's easy to find a data science job. Uh, you can get very well paid to do, it, to do it, but also there is some bad connotations on it. So uh, usually a lot of roles are ill-defined, so you can, find unless, uh, you can find with the same tag things that are really, really different. Um, and expectations sometimes can be actually quite uh, not fair to, to, to what it is. Um, to define what I mean with data science, I'm going actually to just talk about it, to just talk about what is the, the cycle of data science for me, as, as it could be the cycle of, of uh, development, and we will just see it on the go, what I mean with data science. And I'm going to start that introduction cycling around this, this, this nice picture. This is called the hero's journey, which uh, I took from Wikipedia, probably. Uh, and I'm not even sure if the context of this image was like talking about movies or books or whatever. But it's a very nice, uh, it's a very nice metaphor for, I think, for most agile development cycles. And a very, very good one for, for data science. Um, that thing that is called the, the call to adventure in, in that diagram is what I call uh, the problem to solve of the business questions. Uh, everything needs to start with that. All pieces of work that we do in data science need to start with a business question, with a problem that you need to solve. Otherwise, you are just doing things for the sake of it. And, and I will be coming back to this theme probably two or three times over the over the presentation because it kind of obsessed me because I see a lot of times the opposite. And, uh, so yeah, here is where, where myself, the pragmatic, is, is coming. Uh, that's always the starting point. And then that threshold between the known and the unknown is when we start actually collecting data uh, and cleaning data to try to, to solve that problem, all those questions. We need then to do exploratory data analysis, which is usually what drives us to some kind of revelation, where we can actually start to having some insights and knowing what we can do, what we cannot do, uh, and so on in the, in the framework of the, of the business that we, that we are working on. Uh, then it comes the algorithms and machine learning, so trying to use that stuff to make some predictions. Uh, and the, le the last things, but not the less important, is at the end, we need to answer those questions that we try to solve or to do a kind of MVP. And we need to remember that this is a cycle. Uh, when you usually uh, arrive to your first model, it's just the first step into making it better. It's just the first step into actually solving that issue. You might then realize that uh, you have learned something, but you have learned that that model is not the kind of or the, the, the correct model that you need to use or that you need to, to, to change the kind of data that you were, that you were doing. As far as you have learned something from the first iteration of the cycle, you're going in the right direction. Um, 
I also want to mention that uh, when, when we talk about data science, especially in, in tech talks like this, uh, most of the time we just focus on, on, on the machine learning and the algorithms, which is fine because it's a lot of fun. And, and if you are talking with people that came from mathematical backgrounds or from uh, programming, they will get really deep into this kind of stuff because we find it fun. Uh, myself included, we find fun to, to be playing with, with Google's Deep Dream Code or to do stuff like that. Now, actually most of the time that we uh, do data science or something similar, we are not playing with those kind of stuff and we are doing many other things like uh, data cleaning or, or exploratory data analysis usually takes much longer than, than uh, playing with algorithms or, or tweaking them. And, and not everybody talks about those kind of stuff. And usually a lot of the pitfalls are, are there. So I'm not going to read all of these things, but I think it's a, it's, it's a very nice uh, list of sentences that I, I agree with most of them. And, and I will just highlight a few things. that data is never clean. Uh, yeah, most of the tasks will not require deep learning or things like that. Most of the tasks actually could, could be done with very easy tricks, and, and we, will, we will see that. And yeah, this is basically uh, a lot of the things I believe. I didn't write this. I, I quote there the, the person who wrote this. But uh, it's very pragmatic. I like it a lot. I, I think it's, there's a lot of, of truths of truth about, about data science there. So let's go inside that cycle, and let's see some examples, and let's try to do some stuff and see how, how that goes. Um, this is a cycle which basically is you get data, you process data, digest the data, and then you use it. And that's like a mantra. Uh, we need to be a bit careful with that mantra because if you go deep into it, you can just, you know, you can try, you can, you can be biased by yourself, biased by the data that you have, and then because I have this kind of data, I'm going to predict these kind of things because that's what I can do, or biased by, oh, I really like to do a neural network right now, so I'm going to do that. Uh, those kind of things happen and happen all the time. And actually, what you should be biased to is through the business to saying, okay, I'm trying to solve this issue. I'm trying to predict this thing. So what, what, what data do I need for that? And what is the kind of algorithm or model that I need to make that prediction? And that's, that's the right approach. Uh, sometimes you might end up using, yeah, the data that you have and doing that cool neural network other times you might be doing a very simple regression or, or just, just drafting some KPIs, but that's fine. Uh, the, goal, the goal always is actually to have an, an action after what you have done. Your goal is that when you have finished your work, something is going to change. Something is going to change in your business or something is going to change in uh, how people use your product or, or in how you see your product or whatever. But there needs to be an action. If it's just like knowledge for the sake of it, something is going wrong and, 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 and you need to fix it. So let's go into getting data. Um, it's, this is a very important part. I'm not going to stop a lot on it, but it's a very important part because we can also be biased in, 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 in getting data. Not a lot of people talk about this, but we can get data from, you know, uh, our internal data store, which could be a, a MySQL uh, database, and getting data then might means doing a SQL command or a series of SQL commands and putting that into maybe your Python code or, or, or a file that you then are going to process and make predictions on. Now, uh, this is very important because usually when then you are going into the machine learning and doing cool stuff with the data, uh, you don't think again about how did you get that data. And if you have done an, an, a mistake or if, or if there is some kind of bias in how you get the data, you, are, have to be, you, you, you will be conditioned for the whole uh, rest of the cycle. Uh, this is the very first step of the funnel. So it, you need to be sure that you are doing it right or that if you are doing something that is uh, where you have questions, you at least have written down those question marks. So, so you know where to go in the future if you need to, uh, if you need to, to review this. Uh, as I was telling, uh, we can get data from what can be internal sources, like, like yeah, the database where you have data around your uh, web page or around your customers or something like that. 
or you can get also external sources, which uh, for me, and obviously I'm biased here because I work on, on, on this, can be things like, like uh, web data, uh, data you get from crawling or, or things like that. Uh, the next step is to, to process that data. And what I'm talking about uh, for processing data, I'm meaning digest the data. Digest the data, so we get from that data that you got from a SQL query, let's say, or, or whatever that is, into the actual ND array that you are going to use in Python to, to make a prediction or to make a plot. That's when the data is ready. And there are steps in between where things can go wrong or where things just can take time to, to, to make. So uh, we are going to do a very simple example. Um, I, this is a web page called, called Speakerpedia, which I find by pure coincidence some time ago. And it's basically like a Wikipedia or, or a list of speakers well, around the world or kind of topics. You can find, I don't know, Obama there or, or, or things like that. And how much they cost if you want to put them in your conference. Basically, this was for me a surprise because I didn't know people charge to speak in places. But apparently, some people do that. Um, so I crawl the whole site, and I make a database of, of, of this stuff just to make some analysis and some quick fun stuff or, or, or insights into how that strange world of people who, uh, um, of people who receive money for speaking work. Um, I've done that with Importaio, but I'm not going to go into how I crawl the, the site. It's pretty easy, and if someone is interested, I can, I can show it to you. Probably take like 10 minutes or so to, to set it up. And I'm using then pandas to, to see the data and also to, to clean it a little bit. Um, uh, as you can see here, I'm just consuming the CSV that was, let's imagine, the output of my crawling. Uh, it was actually. And we got around more than 70,000 speakers, and we got a lot of information. I'm just uh, plotting here some, some of the ones, sorry, uh, showing here some of the ones that we have, like we have the speaker name, the fee, we have the location, tax, stuff. There is a lot of things to, to, to clean here, which is very common in, in getting data from the web. And in some cases, you can just uh, do the cleaning while you extract data. Uh, it's the same when you are calling a database or when you are crawling. If I use the right regex, let's say, I could have turned ahead those fees into a number that will be read as a float here and not as a string, because I have the case. But I've done it very plain and naive just to showcase how these kind of things happen and we need to, to deal with them. Uh, same thing happened for, for Twitters, where we have that uh, inside, uh, inside a list or many other things. I'm actually putting only a few columns here, but I have uh, many others. So um, I'm showing here how, how can we clean, for example, the fee data, because uh, if we are going to do something simple, the, fir the very first thing that I would like to see is you know, how much people uh, charge for speaking and how many people actually charge and things like that. So I can, I can replace very easily the case for zeros in a string and then uh, reload, let's say, the, that, that column of the data frame as a float. And we have then this ready to, to, be, to be used, to be consumed. Um, that's what I'm, what I'm calling basically process the data, getting it ready for that, getting it ready for, for using it. And wow. And um, there is a lot of things to do, to do in using data before going into making predictions with it. And a good example is the data set that we just saw. Uh, one thing uh, that is called, that thing that is called exploratory data analysis is basically knowing, okay, I have that data set, I thought that was cool. Uh, we need to make now something out of it. We need to know where we can start. And I'm breaking my rule here, I know. I have no, no business context or question in this problem, okay? This is just for fun. I'm just, I just don't love that thing, and I'm for fun. I don't really have an, an objective uh, in so far as this. We will see other examples later where, where I have that objective and are more like uh, more real-world examples. Uh, this is not the case. But exploratory data analysis point is very similar. You need to see what, what your data look like. And if I, see what, if, I can, if I want to see what my data look like, in the previous example, well, I can, I can print the, the average, the median, and the most mm, of the fees of that data set, and we see 
very easily here. Well, we have an average fee of more than, what is that? Uh, $20,000, uh, sorry, $12,000. Uh, but the median and the most is zero, which is already telling us, okay, a lot of people actually charge zero. So that average is probably meaningless on that, on that sense. If we do a box plot, we actually see that. We actually see that, uh, we see that, but we see something else. The box plot is not even a box, it's just a line, <laughs> because uh, there is so many things close to zero. And we see that that's also because we have like three outliers here, uh, three outliers that are, I don't know, like a really crazy number. Uh, so crazy that I can think probably maybe it's not true. Maybe it's, you know, I don't know how Speakerpedia works, but we can go back to the source and think again, and this is why we need to think about this kind of stuff. Uh, well, maybe if a Speakerpedia is actually like a Wikipedia and people can edit things, that might be not true. That might be something put in something crazy because that's what, 10 million or whatever? You know, that, that might be, or, or even if it's true, it's, um, is changing a lot anything that I do in my data set. I have 70,000 people here, and just those three guys is going to change all my numbers. So I might want to, to exclude those liars in any further analysis. And uh, one more thing to comment here. I really love box plots. I think they are like one of the most important things, uh, important plots that you can think about. And probably uh, if I can choose only a few plots to work for the rest of my life, it will be like only three or four, and I think I can do it with those. Probably a scatter plot, a box plot, line plot, and an histogram, and who needs something else? Uh, I don't know, journalists to plot pie charts, but really not people who is doing like actual stuff. Now, after saying this, probably tomorrow I'm going to use something else and see that is super important, but uh, that's, that's, that's what I think. Um, we can go deeper into this and say, okay, Let's actually see the histogram, but avoiding those uh, crazy guys to see how actually is this, this is distributed. The distribution is something that we, will, that we will expect ahead, and if we again do the same thing of calculating the median, the mean, and the mode, uh, we see that the average is much lower, but we still see the same, because there is a lot of people charging uh, zero. There is a lot of people also in Speakerpedia who is actually not charging. They are just there because, you know, it's a list where you see people by location and people by um, topics and things like that. So what makes even more sense to do is, is something like this, where I'm seeing how many people uh, do not charge anything and how many people is charging and what is the average uh, for those people, uh, which is around $20,000 for, for a talk. Um, but we see that only like one between four people in a Speakerpedia do that. Now, it's, I'm, this, this, this is getting me back to my previous point of knowing always which are your data sources and how you are biased from the very beginning. Because uh, the right conclusion here is 25% of the speakers in a Speakerpedia charge an average of $20,000. Uh, it's not that 25% of the speakers charge at all. Because not, most of the, the speakers at all don't charge. It's just that you are not on a Speakerpedia. I'm not. Uh, and that's a very important point. It's kind of obvious in this case, and maybe it's not so obvious when you are working with your database on Hadoop, but it's actually the same, and you need to, to have it clear. Um, other things that we can, do, we can do here, and we are not going to do, but we could do stuff like repeat this kind of analysis for uh, a speaker topic and see how different topics uh, have um, charge different, maybe, or have a different ratio between people who charge and people who don't charge. Uh, that's something very easy. We have a column already for the topic. Uh, we can do, I don't know, we can do location versus fee. How, how fee correlate with the location of the speaker. Um, all those kind of crazy stuff. Uh, very interesting. Basically, when we do exploratory data analysis, we always want to do that, that kind of thing of uh, knowing what is our median, what is our mean, what is our mode, what are the percentiles, plotting the data to see how it actually looks like, which outliers do we have, and also uh, which variables correlate or can correlate with, with others. I'm not going to speak a lot about correlation, but I'm going to uh, give you at least one comic about it, uh, which I think is, is kind of important. Mm. This, we can do a, a whole talk just about this. But uh, I think, I think the, the comic probably makes the point even better. So, okay, 
We were using data. This is, that was an example of a very quick and dirty exploratory data analysis. And other things before we go in into predictions is KPIs, uh, K-performing indicators. So what are the, right, what are the, the metrics of the thing that you're trying to solve or, or the thing that you are measuring? Uh, because sometimes just monitoring the right metrics can save your business. And very simple things can, can have a huge impact. Uh, so we, we shouldn't be afraid of going sometimes for, for simple tools uh, to do simple jobs. Every tool has, is right for, for one job. And we shouldn't be afraid of, of things like Excel, you know? Just the, the fact that we can consume data in pandas and do really cool stuff, that doesn't mean that sometimes, uh, I don't know, Excel is not the right tool. And uh, I'm saying this because actually it's how most of the people consume data. CSBs is, is how most of the people consume data and how most, most of the people is also going to read your data. So a lot of times, the output of an, of an analysis or the output of a report or whatever is going to be on the end of CSB. And it's important that we know also how to, not how to work with those tools, that, uh, it's, it's not so difficult, but uh, how to make both use of them. There is even a whole book uh, written by John Foreman called, I think, Simple Data which is just about how to do data science only in Excel. Uh, and, and it's a lot of stuff about modeling and machine learning only in Excel. Uh, when I'm talking about Excel here, I'm talking just about something that can uh, give you a, a graphic interface for viewing and editing at CSB, not really about Microsoft Excel, even if I choose that picture, because I think it's, it's, it's kind of amazing. Um, OK. Let's go now into making actual predictions, into doing some machine learning and modeling. And I'm going to do super simple stuff here, but going to use different examples and, and, and some different, uh, a whole bunch of different algorithms. Um, first of all, when we go to this, this step, is when we separate the data into what is called a train set and a test set. And uh, this means whole world. This means everything into data science, because this is the basics of, what, of why you will be able to, in theory, prove why, why your predictions are correct. This means that all the, the data that we were preparing before, we are going to split it into two, two pieces, and one piece is going to be used to train our algorithm, train our machine learning model, uh, and the other one is the one that we will use only to test the results. So it's the, only, it's the one that we are going to test in the model and then see, oh, uh, if we were right or not, because we, we know the answers for, the, for that one, so we can see what is the answers of our algorithm and if that matches. And we can have some kind of, of accuracy into our predictions. Uh, it's, very, it's very easy to get biased by this. It's very easy also to uh, your data set not being specific enough. You have a sample set that is actually not good enough for the problem that you try to solve, but then you divide it, you train your model, you test it with your test set, and suddenly you say, wow, I have 90% accuracy. And when you suddenly go into a real data set outside your very big data set, the accuracy is completely wrong. Uh, that happened a, uh, happen a lot of time. It's, it's a very big problem. Uh, so we, we need to, to be doing this all, all the time. It's, it's train set and test set is what is going to tell us how good our algorithm is, but it's not like a magic thing it's still biased by how was your first data set and where did you get it and how did you get it. Um, after doing that, we have basically only one question to, 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 to answer from my very simplistic approach, which is, do I want to predict a category or do I want to predict a number? If I want to predict a category, I'm in a, classif in a classification problem. If I want to predict a number, this is just a regression. So there are only basically two things to do. And I'm being simplistic and, and taking edge cases uh, aside. But uh, we can put almost everything in those two buckets and are very, very differentiated. And they depend on what is the output. It's going to be a number or it's going to be a category. Uh, let's start with the, with the regressions because I think it's what, is, uh, what, what everybody has done. Everybody in, in, in high school has used least squares. And least squares is a machine learning algorithm that will make predictions with some data for where some, uh, yeah, it will predict uh, other points for, for the data using some, some trains data that we have. There are others, uh, 
things like lasso or things like support, a support vector regression, for example. We will see an example, but uh, least square feet is basically a machine learning algorithm, and any other regressions that we do are basically going to be the same, or the same in, in, uh, in, in the theory. The only thing that, that will change most of the times is how we are defining the distance between the dots and our perfect line or curve to, that, to, to, to those dots. Uh, how do you define this, this distance, if it's this thing or that thing or any other crazy thing, is what will change between having a very simple uh, algorithm here or having a, a more complex one. But on the end, we are basically doing this. Maybe we are doing this for 20 dimensions and not for two, and you know we have may, maybe a lot of a whole a whole bunch of other problems. But uh, on the end, is this what we are doing? And uh, I'm going to do another example here. Uh, the data that I'm going to use now here is more business oriented. Is hard drives uh, is, is hard drives prices that I also uh, scrape from the internet. So I have a, a whole CSV with like features for hard drives and, and, and prices. And I can, I can basically do very easily a linear regression, which is, I think, is least squares, this thing that I'm doing here, after dividing uh, into test and train set my, my, my data. I can see basically more or less what is the, the variance score for that, uh, uh, for, for that linear regression see how it looks like, uh, and we can very easily uh, using, very easily using uh, Skillern uh, doing more complex, more complex uh, regressions. Support vector machine is just two lines. It's just two lines to train, two lines to, to, to print a score, and probably again 20 lines to, to make a plot, but on the end it's, it's very easy to do, and we can get uh, some, some results. We see that the results here are not much better than the results that were from a list of squares, are just like 5% improvement or something like that, which might, might mean a whole world in a in, in, in business context, but uh, it's actually not a lot. Very quickly, some classification issues. Uh, let's try to do, as an example, uh, let's try to uh, put our heads into how people is using a platform, for example, and here again, I'm doing a real, a real world problem. I'm, just, I'm trying to get uh, to know better the users of Import.io, the, the, the free tool, the free platform, uh, plotting and, and dividing how they use our product. So I'm going to be looking into how much people uh, is using the platform, how many volume do they do of queries, and how often do they do that usage or that volume of, of queries. And I can try to divide that in, in clusters. Uh, that can just tell me something that I didn't know about that data set and, and hopefully make me do better decisions in the future. Um, we again load some stuff from sklearn, uh, we load the data with pandas, uh, we do a, a, quick, uh, a quick model with using MinSIF, which is one, one way to do clusters, or one algorithm to do clusters. Uh, we plot it. I don't love, like how it looks like because we have like bands of stuff, so it basically the only clustering that it has done is in one of the axes, uh, which kind of not, not, not sounds right. Uh, so I'd say, yeah, let's, let's do cummings. If you, if you Google for clusters, most of the people do cummings, so, so let's, let's try it. And we find basically the same thing. And the issue here, which is very obvious for anybody who has done some, uh, some clustering before or even some machine learning before, but not for, for the real beginner, is that you cannot be doing this. This is, this is absolutely wrong. You cannot be working with an axe that go from zero to I don't know what and one that go from zero to one. That's, uh, it's, it's never going to work, especially in, in clustering. So we need to clean the data. I'm not going to do it, but we just basically need to normalize uh, the two variables that we were trying to plot and then we just repeat the same thing. We have now two axes that go from zero to one, and we actually have some kind of clustering that makes more sense visually, but also when I go to the data, because if I now use this stuff to see, okay, which, which, which user is this, and I see it with real examples, I see that it makes a lot of sense, and one of these users can be, I don't know, the user who used Python and has connected an application with, with our API and is doing millions of queries versus the guy who is 
uh, using the UI to do crawling without knowing even what crawling is. And making that prediction might be very valuable because you can implement that into your, I don't know, your, your help desk system and the customer support guy that you have working in your company can know in a half when a ticket support coming if that guy is actually a very technical guy or is a less technical guy or is doing this kind of user or of that kind of usage. And that will improve the experience uh, for the user and the support that they get and also the life or your uh, friends at the support desk. Last thing that I'm talking about very briefly, we're running out of time, uh, is a web page classificator, I think. Uh, decision tree, which is another way to classify uh, things. Uh, in this case, the context is I'm trying to do, uh, I'm trying to basically know which kind of website is a website just by looking at very simple attributes of that website and which type of website, of website I mean classifying the content, the content. So trying to know, okay, this is an e-commerce website or this is a map or this is a uh, jobs application board or this is a events data, things like that. Uh, for that, uh, very easy again with SQL learning, just two, three lines to, to make a decision tree and also to plot it. We plot this thing here, and again, I'm doing a very naive mistake here, which is uh, when you see something like this, a decision tree is supposed to be simple to, uh, simple to read and simple to, to interpret, simple to know what it's telling you. When you see something as big as this, it's because you are doing something very wrong. You are overfitting your whole data set into a lot of very small conditions that will drop into this huge uh, list of categories and, and decisions uh, to then make the classification of categories. Uh, we can very easily change that just by, by doing a lot of things, actually, but the most simple one, you can just say, no, the maximum, the maximum number of leaf nodes that I want is this, and then you've got a, ma a much simpler uh, decision tree, which you can read and try to see if it makes sense, which you can make a prediction very easily, also in only one line, with your test data, and see actually how it, how it uh, works out. And that's it, the recap. Always know what problem are we trying to solve. Uh, clean your data and get it ready to use. Beware of very common uh, problems like overfitting, I try to make an example of that, or normalization of, of your data, I try also to make an, an example of that, and, and always try to have an output which is some, something actionable, something that you say, okay, we finished this analysis and now we need to change this in our business, now we need to change this in how we do support with our people or, or in how we are doing this in our product or in how we are dealing with this data. If there is no that kind of action, basically the whole thing has failed, and you need to, to learn from that cycle and go again into the loop and, and, and make it better. So that was it. Uh, just telling you that we are hiring a lot at Import.io, so there's a lot of different positions, DevOps, front-end, QA, uh, even Python uh, with, with, very, with a lot of data connotations on the role. Uh, so anyone, anyone that wants to talk about that or about data science, or about Python, or about web scraping, I will be here for, for the next few days, and I will be very happy to, to engage in any conversation. Thanks for your attention. Do we have any questions? Um, I've just seen that you jumped over the abyss in the adventurous cycle. Sure. Uh, the abyss, like the death and the rebirth. Is there something in data science too like that? In the hero cycle, in the beginning. Oh, uh, in the cycle. Oh, sorry, what was the question around the cycle? I didn't, cannot hear you very you well. You didn't ref reference the abyss, the rebirth at all. The what? The rebirth and the abyss like the death of a friend. Huh? Yeah. yeah. You're referring, oh, sorry. You're referring about this. Oh. The very bottom. Oh, <laughs> sorry, I know now what you mean, yeah. I didn't refer about that, but I think that's, that's precisely the moment 
I have, I have actually words for all the things there, so I have the metaphor very well in my head. And, and the app is basically is, uh, that moment of realization where you know what kind of problem are you really trying to solve from a mathematical point of view, so what algorithm is going to work. Because when we are doing just exploratory data analysis or when we are doing the data cleaning, we might not even know at that moment for a complex problem, we might not know at that problem if we are going to do a regression of a classification. We might not, and even less, what kind of algorithm is better for that uh, classification problem or for that regression. That's the point of the revelation, basically, when you think you have an idea of how to solve that, and then you just need to apply it, which is much easier. <laughs> and what is your experience with sklearn as, as a, when you were um, a beginner? Yeah, do I have to know, uh, uh, trying around with different parameters, parameters until I get a result, or do, uh, don't not, have to know the internals of, of the algorithms? It's, it's very easy to use, SQLearn. Basically, uh, in, the documentation, in the documentation page, there is even a tutorial of how to approach it from the sense, like, depending what kind of friend do you have, what do you need to, what algorithm do you need to use, which is like a great map into how to do machine learning with it. And once you know what algorithm you're going to use, which is usually just a few lines of code to, to put in there, uh, knowing which right parameters are going, you need to use, it's, if we are objective, it's a very hard problem, and it's basically the whole thing around this, is how do you fit those parameters? But from a simplistic point of view, it's not so much, you can just use basically some defaults or something's almost at random. You can basically do a loop and, and iterate through different parameters and see how it looks like. You always need to have an, an output from your model, which is uh, either a plot or a prediction, or even better, the two of them. So you can see, okay, I put these parameters, this is my, out, my output, do I like it or not? Let's change the parameters till, till we fit something that we think it makes sense. Uh, that will be a simplistic approach into how to uh, change parameters and, and fit in the right things uh, using sklearn. Okay, thanks. All right, do we have one last question? No. Uh, thank you, Ignacio, for a good talk. And uh, let's all head out for the apparently fabulous lunch. Thank you very much.